Hi, my name's Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. On the 17th of June 2020, I gave a presentation to the Russian Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Group and I called it, Are We Witnessing Something Strange? And essentially that was uh, leading to uh, a discussion about an experiment that could be done based on some observations by Thermocore in the 1990s, Rossi in the early 2010s, uh, myself uh, and uh, Matti Vellat as part of the MFMP in a Chalani cell in 2013, and a work by Zata Lepin and Baranoff, and most recently by Desireless. And this was to do with some type of <clears throat> radiation being emitted from cells that were either for the first time being treated with a hydrogen isotope, having been degassed and maybe heated, and or being repressurized. So if you want to look at that presentation, it is on our YouTube channel here. And the following morning, I woke up to a email from one Dr. Alexander Parkamov, who wanted me to look at work that Yurji Bajatov, the sadly departed former leader of the Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Group in Russia, and a load of scientists, including Alexander Parkamov, and that was investigation of radiation effects during loading of nickel, beryllium, and lanthanum nickel and here is the paper which I discussed in that video, and you can go and look at that in your own time. I suggest you go and have a look at the video. Anyway, I was asked a question by someone on the YouTube comment section that suggested that this was just some sort of effect caused by photon hardening, x-ray hardening. And I didn't believe that that is the case, and so I argued the case. And in doing so, I referred back to the work of Ed Storms, which happened later in that year of 2012, and this paper, Nature of Energetic Radiation Emitted from Metal Exposed to H2. And there's something in this paper that inspired me to make a presentation based on one of my findings in there in ASTI in 2017. And that was about the potential for using oxygen 18 as an isotopic tracer and the reason I was saying this was that we know that the fermion proton is ejected from low energy nuclear reaction systems as found by Pientelli and Ficardi in the 1990s. So I was suggesting that that could do the PN reaction producing fluorine and why this is important I will come on to when I do some further analysis in light of what I understand now to potentially be the process that is going on. So I want to go over this paper and just draw some experience in that we've had recently and discussions that have been made. So without further ado I shall do that. So the nature of energetic radiation emitted from metals exposed to hydrogen. Layers of metals were applied so as to cause local stress, which is proposed to create voids in which nuclear reactions can be initiated when the material is exposed to H2. Photon emission having energy sufficient to pass through 3.86 grams per centimeter squared of absorbing material was detected using Geiger-Muller detector. Now, this would comport with the claim or the assertion by the person that was challenging what I was saying on the YouTube comments section. However, I will make an argument that actually something else is going on and uh, you can see what you think about that. Okay, so I'm just going to pull out a few things. Use your own time to delve into this. As always, I will give all the links to the papers and other materials in the YouTube comments sections for this video. Anyway, this radiation, in addition to revealing how nuclear reactions can be initiated in ordinary materials, must be explored to avoid health risks when such systems are studied or used as energy sources. So basically, he's saying these highly anomalous and conflict with conventional understandings. He's basically saying there is some type of radiation that is emitted from various experiments and that this needs to be established as to what that is so that we can safely perform these experiments. And this is essentially what the Russians were saying in 2018, and I would certainly agree with this with all the things that I have seen over the recent years. So unusual radiation, he doesn't call it strange radiation, he calls it unusual radiation, both particle and photon, 
has been found when certain materials are exposed to H2 or D2. And goes on to say, energetic particles that were visible in a cloud chamber. And he's talking about work by, for instance, Piantelli and Ficardi. And he's giving the reference there. And I've noted here in this, these are protons. So I'll give you a link to the original paper and I'll give you a link to my annotated paper. Here he says neutrons. And we did this presentation in, uh, I think it was 2017, after we had been to uh, visit Mi-356 and Suhas Ralkar, and they both had titanium that had bred vanadium, and, and at least in the case of Mi-356, he had reported observing neutrons. And this is important because Piantelli in 2015, in January 2015, had told us that the interaction between the ejected protons, these fermions that are ejected, uh, from the active agent in Lena, whatever that is, is interacting with vanadium-50 producing neutrons. And that's discussed in the YouTube video that you can go and have a look at there. Anyway, and there's also here Matsumoto detecting radiation using X-ray film produced by nickel cathode in a glass electrolytic cell containing H2O and potassium carbonate. Potassium carbonate. You'll see why I'm making an emphasis there. Anecdotal experience has been reported by Rossi and Chalani. Notice those two names. I will refer to those back at the end of the presentation. Claiming radiation is detected when heat production is first initiated, but is much reduced later while extra energy is being made. This is the observation that we had in 2013 when our cell was dropping from three bars to one bar due to a leak in the inline control cell, which was linked we had to repressurize it to the operating pressure of three bar. And every time that was done with fresh hydrogen out of a little lecture can, there was this increase in radiation that died away after a few minutes, like a tripling of radiation on a Geiger Muller tube. And I actually <laughs> cancelled whatever I was doing. I flew to France and uh, this was replicated in front of my eyes and uh, we did a whole blog on it. And this blog inspired Jean-Paul Berrien to go and do a test, and he replicated the same process within 24 hours. And within a period of weeks, we had lots of people reporting similar effects. So uh, I've only given this a few examples, but it's as well to come back to this paper. Now, um, this image that you see down the bottom right here is from Piantelli and Ficardi's work. He told us that this came from the rod that was the one that produced their highest excess and also that produced this intense flux of neutrons. And that is the one that he determined was this proton vanadium-50 in the stainless steel of his classic Piantelli Ficardi reactor um, that was causing these neutrons. And when they got the rod back, because some cleanup crew had to go in there and uh, find out what was going on, when they got the rod back, this is in the cloud chamber three weeks later. So it's still emitting protons three weeks after the reaction had occurred. So whatever is the active agent that's in here is at room temperature able to still cause the ejection of these fermions at incredibly high energies. And as I showed you in here, I was saying here's a chart of resonant energies for the uh, oxygen PN18 fluorine reaction. And I think it was 6.7 or 8 uh, mega electron volts was the energy that he had actually calculated these protons can be ejected at. And that is well within the range to enable this oxygen 18 to fluorine 18 reaction. And so, yes, this was three weeks after the reactor was run. So the active agent is still operating weeks after and at a cold temperature. So whatever made this is able to still perform its work at room temperature without any other form of stimulation later on. So this was his experimental setup. He had the sample, whatever the material was. It was in an aluminium cell. There was a glass surround. That was all in a copper cup. And there was a vacuum area and there was a steel wall on the outside. And then they had a Geiger Muller tube. And I presume in the photo here, that is that Geiger Muller tube. They also had another one here, some distance away. And that was behind a lead sheet or whatever. So it was only <laughs> getting background. And uh, he talks about that in here. This this is the material the so-called photon radiation is traveling through. He refers to holes here as being what he calls the nuclear active environment. I will come on to deal with this aspect of low energy nuclear reactions in a future presentation. Holes are certainly one area in which the active agent can be synthesized and so that was his approach. Okay so 
Note, he is heating it to 305. This is within the kind of temperatures that we have found these emissions to be produced. And in fact, this is the temperatures that the Bajatov and, and Parkamov et al. team said that they only saw radiation between 200 and 350 degrees. So in this case, this experiment was 250 to 350 degrees. So you have a very similar sort of temperature range that this is occurring at. Several heating and vacuum cycles required before significant radiation was started at 1,350 minutes while the sample was at 305 degrees and H2 was being pumped out. So you had a change of pressure and so there's hydrogen exchanging maybe from the material. And I'm saying same temperature as Bajatov et al. He's saying every time an absorber was inserted in any sample, an immediate reduction in radiation was observed, followed by slow decay. Once the absorber had been removed, an immediate increase in radiation occurred, followed by a slow increase to a steady value. And so he's saying in the second Geiger-Muller counter, located at a distance from the sample, also shows unusual behavior. Radiation was being detected by GM2, which slowly decreased when an absorber stopped radiation from the sample from reaching GM1, as seen in figure 13. This means the radiation being detected by GM2 originated from GM1, not from the apparatus. This behavior was observed on several occasions when other samples were treated in the same way. So you've got this radiation temperature sort of coming up here, vacuum 330 degrees, 333 degrees, and it's coming up, radiation sort of detection is coming up, a vacuum applied, so it's bleeding the hydrogen, and it's at 305 degrees, and it starts shooting up. And then they insert the lead, and it come, drops down, but then it sort of decays away. Lead removed, shoots up, and then they have vacuum here at 210 degrees, so this is over the 200 degrees that was identified by Bajatov and Parkamov. And so they are coming up here, and it's increasing, increasing, increasing. Puts the lead in, and you can see there's an immediate drop from here down to here, and then there's a the decay. So he's saying that the decay here is due to something going on in a Geiger-Muller tube 1. And here, this is the comparison between GM1 and GM2. It's not so clear there, but I think he does a blow-up here. And so you can see it's coming up, uh, inserts the lead, drops down, and then decays away. And this is GM2, comes up, and it just decays away. So it's like this radiation here is mostly something that's coming from GM1 because there's no real step here. It just gets to here, you put the lead in, and it kind of decays away, decays away. So that there's radiation that's detected in this GM1 uh, that isn't detected in the GM2, but whatever's being produced in the Geiger Muller tube 1 is always being detected in the GM2 until the decay falls away. Okay. The sample was heated through 212 degrees in 3.7 atmospheres of hydrogen when the radiation intensity first increased at 200 minutes. So I've got here same temperature range as Bajatov et al. So again, putting the lead in, take the lead out. Now they are detecting this half-life of 109 minutes. 109 minutes. In fact, he actually specifically says it's about 109 minutes. Let's go in the fact that he's identifying a decay rate of 109 minutes. Well, this is why I suggested that this is oxygen 18 PN reaction to fluorine 18. And that is because it's 109.7. So he says about 109 minutes. Well, the only isotope that you can see in the literature that has this 109 minute decay is fluorine 18. It's one of the most studied things that exists because it's used in positron emission tomography. So that's why I suggested it there, but I'm kind of, with all the information I've had since, I'm going to update where I think that is probably coming from. So here he's saying, because the energy of the photons is not altered by penetration through matter, only a small flux that leaks from the apparatus is required to identify a source of radiation. Most of the radiation would be stopped within the apparatus. So this is essentially what the guy was talking about that questioned my previous presentation, that it was kind of radiation hardening, uh, a photon hardening. It's basically like a, a low-pass filter, only the high-energy radiation can get through. Um, saying two sources of radiation are detected. One source is produced by the sample and can be stopped almost completely by 1.6 grams per centimeter squared of lead in addition to 3.9 grams per centimeter squared provided by the apparatus. This radiation originates from samples. The other kind of radiation originates in GM1. 
This radiation grows slowly when GM1 is exposed to radiation from the sample and decays away when an absorber stops radiation from the sample. This secondary radiation has enough energy to pass through considerable absorber and detected by GM2 located well away from the primary source. This radiation apparently causes growth of a radiation emitter within GM1 having an average half-life of about 109 minutes. The activated nuclei cannot be aluminium, silicon, oxygen, nickel, iron or chromium because these elements are present in the sample and in the construction of materials. Now this is where I made a mistake when I was making the suggestion in 2017 because oxygen is actually in the materials of the reactor itself. So, you know, you would expect the same decay to be observed. It wasn't unless, you know, the energies aren't sufficient at that point. But uh, that was the kind of what went through my head because there was something missing here and I'm going to go into what was missing. Because these elements are present in the sample and in construction materials which show no such activation. Only the mica window of GM1 contains elements not present anywhere else. And so there's a list of these, and he actually concludes, he's got all the list here that they detected in the EDX analysis, and he suggests that the only thing here that could have been activated is potassium-40. Now, I don't agree, and because potassium-40, if you activate it, I'm not really aware that there is some form of activation of potassium-40 that is able to produce this 109-minute decay. However, there is the fluorine 18. And what is interesting about what is in mica, so this is a mica window, is that he doesn't work out that there is fluorine in there. And in fact, the reality is every single type of mica contains fluorine. So I've given some link here. You can go and do the research. But every single type of mica contains fluorine. And in addition, the type of mica typically used for the windows on GM tubes of this type is muscovite. And muscovite has actually fluorine in the potassium fluoride molecule. It specifically has potassium fluoride. And the other interesting thing is lipidolite, which is another type of mica, is one that was claimed by Francesco Cellani. That actually contains rubidium as well. And as we know, rubidium has a beta isotope that has been demonstrated to decay by three-body alignments in the work of Xu Wenju between 1988 and 1999. And that was from the positioning of nuclear clocks that use rubidium-87 inside and outside that of the shadow of, say, a solar or lunar eclipse. So we know that there is potential. <laughs> uh, I think you can see where I'm going. We have potassium-40. He's actually saying that it's likely to be potassium-40 that is somehow activated or involved. And Francesco Cellani actually said that he was using lipidolite, which has potassium and fluorine in there, but it additionally has rubidium-87, or it has rubidium, but a lot of rubidium is naturally rubidium-87, which is a beta isotope. And when I was thinking about why our excess maybe wasn't as high as Francesco Cellani's, one thing to consider was that we may be using a type of mica that didn't have lithium in it, because lithium is also in lipidolite, okay? However, at that time, wasn't really considering the potassium-40 that is in there and also the rubidium-87. So that may have been playing a serious role, and I think you might agree by the time of this uh, end of this presentation. Now, the other thing is, is why did he not see fluorine? Now, look, he could have just gone onto Wikipedia, as I did, and worked out that every type of mica has fluorine in it, okay? And that the mica most likely used for this type of Geiger Muller tubes that he was using has uh, uh, potassium and fluorine directly as molecules as part of the structure of the mica layers. And so uh, he could have worked that out. But um, I don't blame him completely because he was using EDX, sometimes called EDS. And if you look at EDS, EDS has a specific problem between the fluorine K line and iron L line. And so you, you don't see them when you use EDS, EDX, because they're just too close. And in fact, you need something like this from Thermo Scientific. And this is a wave dispersive spectrometer, WDS. 
and that is able to do much finer lines on the x-ray to separate the iron and the fluorine in there and we know that there is iron 3% weight he detected that in his muscovite most likely muscovite and so this means that he's not actually able to have detected the fluorine it says here, these photons are proposed to react with potassium-40. I agree here. Uh, nuclei in the mica window of Geigermüller to stimulate its decay by beta and gamma emission. And these are the modes that it can decay because there's an electron capture, there's a, a beta plus and a beta minus types of modes of decay of potassium-40. So consequently, the count rate of G GM1 is the sum of radiation coming from the sample and from the activated nuclei as its concentration increases until the activation rate equals the decay rate. Once the activating radiation from the sample is stopped by insertion of an absorber, this two millimeters or whatever it is of lead, the activated nucleus decays with a characteristic half-life. Some of the en energetic gamma from this decay can reach GM2 and cause a slight increase in its count. So, you know, if you have the positron emission from the fluorine 18, the positron interacts with an electron and it causes two gammas, and so you will get the gamma uh, interaction. So I'm getting into what I think might be going on here, and I'm saying that all black EVO string vortex solitons are released from the reactor. These get excited and released, release photons and beta particles. Uh, they cause uh, production of uh, uh, 18 fluorine. This causes the near 109 minute decay. So I'll just read his conclusion here. Materials treated in a manner to provoke, produce void. So he's just talking about how to better make the reaction matrix interact with hydrogen better. This radiation is able to activate a nucleus exposed to this radiation which decays with an average half-life of about 109 minutes. This proton radiation can be produced using uh, chromium which is not magnetic. Sorry, this I think he means this photon radiation <laughs> can be produced using chromium which is not magnetic and nickel which is a magnetic after metals are subject to stress. Nickel also reacts with copper to form the same type of structure after which a photon he says it photon here rather than proton radiation is produced when the alloy is exposed to h2 so the next thing i'm going to do is show you a uh, spreadsheet where i've calculated potential reaction paths here is the reaction table and it is quite a lot of data that i'm going to go over here however i want you to know that you can download a pdf of what i've uh, got here and you can look at it in your own time Anyway, uh, what I've got up here on the uh, top left is uh, the uh, deuterium, helium, uh, fluorine 18, fluorine 19, argon, potassium, potassium, potassium 39, 40, 41, and calcium 40. The reason I've got argon here is because that is one decay mode of potassium 40, and uh, I've got calcium 40 here, which is the predominant day decay mode of uh, potassium 40. The reason I've got fluorine 18 here is because this is... As I said, uh, thought in 2017, the only thing that could account for this 109 minute or so decay, and it's 109.771, which certainly matches the description uh, of the calculation uh, done by uh, Ed Storms uh, of something that's about 109 minutes. And um, uh, I've gone uh, and put del uh, deuterium and helium here just to give you an example of uh, what the, um, uh, a potential fusion reaction could give you in terms of energy. And so that just speaks to some things that are on the table. Now, uh, why I have uh, uh, highlighted things uh, as fluorine and potassium here, uh, the reason I've highlighted those is because they are in all mica. Uh, and so, uh, and in specifically in um, uh, muscovite mica, uh, it uh, can be in the form of potassium fluoride molecule uh, coupled with the, the rest of the structure of the mica. The uh, orange, uh, light orange here, the kind of yellowy orange is for bosons and the reds are for fermions. Okay, and then I have green here uh, which are indicating the most uh, uh, prevalent uh, isotopes in the Earth's crust. So, uh, so if you've got helium four here, this is 99.99999 whatever uh, of uh, the helium that you have in the Earth uh, environment. 
uh, fluorine 19 is 100 percent and the potassium 40 is a very little uh, 0.0118 percent but potassium 39 is 93.1 percent so as we move forward if you have a potassium fluoride molecule 93.1 percent of that potassium fluoride molecule will be potassium 39 and uh, fluorine 19 uh, so that is the most likely thing you will have 0.0118% of uh, uh, those molecules will be uh, potassium uh, 40 and uh, uh, 19 fluorine. Okay, so here's a reaction. Two deuteriums, uh, you have the binding energies and you have the output binding energies. It's going from non-naturally uh, uh, rich isotopes, so, so there's hardly any of the crust is deuterium, uh, and it's going to the most abundant form of helium. And you've got two bosons going to bosons. So my arguments that I've been making um, in the last couple of years uh, and the way that the uh, Parkamov uh, reaction tables are uh, structured and so forth is that um, the system does not like to produce fermions, but it will. Typically, uh, the fermions that we know that low energy nuclear reactions produce are protons, as I talked about in the first part of this presentation, uh, which were identified by Piantelli. And the basis of his patents is that you get the excess heat by interacting the ejected protons, which can eject up to, known to eject up to three weeks later, <laughs> by uh, having a secondary material, say, uh, uh, boron or, or lithium in play to do a neutronic reactions and so that that is how we know it ejects protons tom clater proved that uh, in corona discharges you can have the production of tritons and again tritons is the second uh, uh, fermionic nuclei and it is being produced which means it's being ejected in my view from the active structure that is doing the bulk of the low energy nuclear reaction work and so we do know that it will synthesize fermions but they will be ejected uh, it tends to like to produce bosons so when you have two bosons they're great food to go in and they form another boson and the other tell is that there's a net energy production so um, if you're trying to squeeze things into a very small space, uh, the, the net energy production is something that indicates that it is being able to be put into a small space. And bosons can occupy the same space time. So you want things to be in the bosonic state. If they're in the fermionic state, they get ejected. <laughs> okay, um, that's, that's my view. Not, not always, but if there's this magnetic pressure, this intense magnetic pressure, and that's a presentation that I will come on to probably next, uh, where you have this incredible uh, uh, packing uh, intensity in these uh, rings uh, and you've seen these kind of ejections from rings in the lion reactor and, and so forth. So uh, I've done a number of reactions here and the first one is that if we have cold neutrinos being synthesized in the reactor and these uh, come, kind of uh, form into string vortex solitons which are also another name in my view as uh, for black evos this comes out of the reactor, can penetrate through all of that material that he had in the way, and can stimulate the uh, potassium four to beta decay, leaving just high energy beta. So this could account for the immediate uptick in uh, radiation when you remove the lead. And it could be the case that the uh, lead oxide and the lead and then the lead oxide and the air either side of that is enough of a thin sheet um, to prevent uh, the EVOs that are coming from this particular reactor through the environments that it's having to travel through from being able to uh, interact with the uh, potassium in the uh, geiger muller tube Mus muscovite. And so, uh, um, uh, as we know, thin sheets and, and, and um, uh, impedance changes are good at trapping the evo and so the the evo could maybe get there and if it doesn't get excited it might get reflected or it might uh, because we know from uh, uh, alexander parkamov's book space earth human that these condensed uh, 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 neutrinos this the uh, strange radiation it can be reflected and lent by solid matter so maybe enough of it is reflected by that uh, uh, he actually used steel in his case to re reflect reflect them. And it's like glass. Like glass will reflect light, but let some through. And may maybe in this case, 
uh, the, the circumstances were that the predominant of the these were reflected. And so uh, when you remove the lead, that interacts with the potassium-40 and you get calcium. This is the reaction that potassium-40 li likes to do most. And there's a very good reason uh, you want to go there in the geological record, that calcium is the fifth most abundant element in the crust. It's also the first um, uh, element that's uh, sort of an alkaline element. So uh, potassium actually is the eighth most ab uh, abundant element in the crust. Now if you argue these are all made in one go, and I'm not arguing that in the fullness of things, but if you say everything that was on the earth it started in one instantaneous event and, and we're just seeing the end products of all of this, then nature naturally in that event wanted to create calcium more than potassium, which meant there's a, a kind of like potential desire to go from uh, whatever type of potassium there is to calcium. And so we have this potassium here to calcium. Okay, so we are going from a boson to a boson. That fits the, the sort of packet into a small box. And there is a net energy yield in doing that. And so that means, again, it's fitting it into a small box. So this is a likely occurrence. So um, now, what if we consider the fluorine and the fact that we really need to convert our fluorine uh, in uh, 19, which is 100% of natural fluorine, we need to convert that into um, fluorine 18 to see this 109 minute decay. Well, um, we, we know in uh, certain types of muscovite, potassium fluoride is very, very tightly bound. It's a molecule, you know, it's highly electronegative sort of combination, uh, 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 ionic combination between potassium and uh, fluorine. And so there is an electron shared between them, and that could really be playing a role in that, uh, you, you know, you have a... Uh, so some tight binding and then in comes your um, excited now because maybe the the uh, string vortex soliton black evo has been t gone from being in uh, a neutral mode in which it can pass through all of that reactor material it's interacted with some potassium it's caused some beta decay these high energy 1.3 uh, 1 1 uh, energy uh, mega electron volt uh, betas uh, which is an electron, and that has maybe ionized a load of particles, which produced a load of free electrons, which is what EVOs like to be fed on, according to Ken Shoulders. So we now have a white EVO, which is able to interact more with the matter in the um, in the uh, the muscovite in the the Geiger Muller tubes uh, window, and so that progressively builds and builds and builds, uh, and and so it, there there is an increase in interaction with the potassium and the fluorine. Now, if I take this reaction one here, and rather than uh, uh, saying I'm going from potassium forty to calcium forty, I'm actually going to stim simulate uh, sorry uh, uh, synthesize potassium forty. Uh, from potassium 39 because as I said 93.1% of potassium fluoride in in this uh, molecule is going to be uh, containing uh, potassium 39 and so we have potassium 39 here and essentially what's happening is they're being crushed so much together so much together that we're seeing what we also saw in the Hutchison uh, uh, fracture sample where you had four atoms uh, of aluminium going in, which are all bosonic, sorry, all fermionic. They're all 27 aluminium, the nuclei. And out of it, you're getting magnesium, which is fermionic, and uh, silicon, which is fermionic, with silicon in the center spot, i.e. the most dense part is in the center, and then in the outside, it's less dense, but it's still wanting to produce bosons. So, under my understanding, you have... Two fermionic nuclei, and in fact, this is just a representation on just looking at two to two, but in fact, this would be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, because in each exotic vacuum object, you can have, say, a hundred thousand, uh, uh, for every hundred thousand electrons, you can have a one ion. And if you've got 10 to the 23 electrons, you've still, you've still got a massive number of potassium and fluorine that are in there. They're fermionic, and they're being squeezed in this incredible, incredible magnetic vortex uh, uh, that's looping on itself, and that's crushing it with unimaginable, unimaginable pressures, much more intense than that in the centre of the sun. And so if it wants to occupy the smallest space possible, it has to become a boson. And all it has to do is change from uh, being uh, fluorine uh, 19 uh, to uh, fluorine 18. 
and that causes the uh, uh, proton effectively to move from the uh, fluorine nucleus to the potassium nucleus Bonk. and so you get potassium 40 and fluorine uh, 18 that is synthesizing uh, your fluorine 18 from the uh, most abundant uh, molecule that is in your uh, muscovite uh, by just straight neutron transfer now there's a reaction here that I have which is saying like now we've got potassium uh, 40 that can go to argon so that's the other one so we've got going to argon and calcium from potassium 40 calcium and argon so if we combine reaction 1 and reaction 2 we start off with 39 potassium and fluorine 19 and we produce argon 40 and fluorine 18 and we go from two fermions to two bosons and that is a neutron transfer an electron capture and a neutrino okay the other reaction is when we end up with calcium we start with again 39 potassium and fluorine 9, uh, um, 19 and we go to calcium 40 so we are combining this reaction producing uh, the uh, uh, potassium 40 with our R0 uh, which is producing the calcium 40 and here we have uh, a situation where we have two fermions going to uh, a two bosons and you have here uh, calcium now as I said calcium is the fifth most abundant element in the crust it's also an element that likes to come out of Lenner reactions so my prediction is that this reaction here is the most likely reaction that's going to occur this may occur uh, but this in my view is the most likely reaction to occur out of this system and in fact it it, it probably wouldn't be these two steps the, 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 everything would occur simultaneously um, and you wouldn't actually see a rise in potassium 40 uh, because if there was a rise in potassium 40 well immediately the the, <laughs> the neutrinos in in the uh, cold neutrino condensate which is the string vortex soliton which is the black evo um, is going to uh, cause that to decay anyway and what does it decay to well it decays to calcium 40 <laughs> okay so i think you're getting the idea here now down the bottom here um, i'm saying that uh, uh, there's another reaction here, reaction three, uh, where you can have uh, potassium fluorine going to, uh, um, uh, and this is fluorine 19, uh, going to uh, potassium 41 and uh, fluorine 18. I do not think that this is likely. Why? Because you're taking a boson and making it into a fermion. <laughs> and you're also producing things that are rare um, in, in the case of potassium-41. It's a very rare isotope uh, relatively to uh, potassium-39. Uh, so not as rare as <laughs> potassium-40, but um, only 6.8%. So nature is telling you that this is an unlikely reaction. It may happen, but it's an unlikely reaction. So I think all said and done, it's going to be one of these two reactions that are synthesized in the fluorinate uh, uh, and so forth, and that people could consider rather than using muscovite or lipidolite and lipidolite as was used in Francesco Cellani's reactor um, which had also rubidium 87 that beta isotope uh, in addition to the um, potassium 40 um, you you could use uh, pure potassium uh, fluoride which you can get from Sigma Altridge and I've given a link there or you could put crushed up uh, um, muscovite into your reactor in some place. Now, uh, potassium fluoride sort of breaks down, I think, in 800, between 800 and 900 degrees or something like that. So you can have it in an area of the reactor where you want it to excite your cold neutrino condensates into being active Lena reactor, uh, reactants, uh, a white EVO. Or... Uh, you can use it even, I'm suggesting here, as a potential detector. So rather than saying, oh, it's potassium and we don't really know why it's decaying at, <laughs> at 109, around about 109 minutes, we specifically use potassium fluoride in front of detectors uh, uh, to maybe detect for strange radiation. So th this is potentially um, a way to detect for strange radiation. So I'm saying here, the implication is that you can add potassium or other beta isotopes to your fuel mixture to get and keep exotic vacuum objects in their white state, whereupon they can perform nuclear reactions that may have application in a range of ways. Um, this is a mica window supplier. There's a link to that, and it's in India. 
and uh, it's talking about it being Muscovite, so you can get your mica windows from there. Now, there's this paper here that came out in May. It's by Luca Gam uh, Gamberale, and it's coherent neutron production, and it's it's going on about sort of electron capture and so on, and it does the the uh, maths to work out uh, various uh, you know the, the scenarios under which the uh, neutrons can be produced, and it is uh, speaking to the uh, widdam larsen model. But you can go and read this also in your own time. But I just want to pick out something here at the bottom. It's saying, the basic idea is that vibrational coherent configurations of electrons and protons in the metal have a collective energy which is sufficient to overcome the mass energy gap for one single electron capture. Okay, the result of the calculation is uh, that ultra-cold neutrinos are indeed produced together with low energy neutrino flux. The theory presented gives a solid theoretical ground uh, for development of presently non-existing low-energy monochromatic electron neutrino sources. Okay, and so I'm saying here, and I will go on to my kind of like uh, boom slide here. His paper is really talking about how resonance can uh, uh, stimulate it, and then I will discuss uh, the brute force. OK, first off, perhaps the production of low energy monochromatic electron neutrino is optimal between 179 degrees C and 350 degrees C in hydrogen storage metals, given all the evidence I have presented in recent presentations. Due to resonant terahertz far infrared coherent photonic stimulation of electron capture processes between dense hydrogen and lattice electrons. Some neutrons are having sufficient energy to escape the lattice. So what I'm saying there, my bad English there, is that uh, we observed around the sort of 250 uh, degrees and around about 180 degrees these neutrons uh, in uh, GS 5.3. And other people had observed neutrons when we put that out there. Said, yeah, we've sort of seen neutrons as well. Um, so, uh, but what the paper is suggesting is that, of course, if you're doing electron capture, you're also synthesizing. And they claim that it is low energy monochromatic electron like neutrinos, low energy. Well, uh, another word for cold neutrinos is ultra low energy neutrinos. Okay. The additional resultant low energy neutrinos magnetically cluster, this is what I'm saying, to form string vortex solitons, SVS, also known as black exotic vacuum objects, black EVOs, which are a solitons of condensed low energy neutrinos. Due to their neutral nature, they can exit the reactor, allowing them to interact with remote beta isotopes, so, such as 40 potassium, stimulating their decay and resulting in black EVOs being energized into the white EVOs that can then perform wider scale transmutations. This small window effect, i.e. the small temperature window of effect between 179 degrees and 350 degrees, requires the reactants to be temperature cycled. In the case of Rossi's original ECAT, which was claimed by some to contain potassium carbonate, therefore you have potassium. If you really wanted to make it good, I would suggest uh, having uh, uh, carbon made from carbon-14, ideally from a moderator blocks from an RVMK reactor or one of the British types. But anyway, Rossi's original ECAT uh, was temperature cycled. Could it be to go through, uh, up and down through this temperature domain uh, without him knowing it to synthesize these cold neutrino condensates, these string vortex solitons that then interacted with the potassium in there and it's not in the way of a catalyst. The potassium is going to uh, a calcium. It's emitting the electrons. The electrons are uh, causing uh, um, avalanche electrons to be produced. That feeds the neutral string vortex soliton, making it into a white EVO. And the white EVO can then grab material and do broad scale uh, transmutation. Okay. Uh, or to have temperature gradients. As I said in ICCF 22 in the question session after I presented the Parkamov 225 day reactor, Pian Telly had told us that he had a temperature gradient in the metal rod. And this is so that, for instance, if you get a bit over here that gets up to the resonant temperature, to, in my view, to produce these uh, uh, um, 
uh, string vortex solitons, then uh, that might raise the temperature because you've got some nuclear reactions going on. And that raises the temperature because you've got a temperature gradient, it moves up and down. And in fact, he was talking about the fact that it moves up and down over an area. So if it moves along here, it, it kind of like changes the temperature over there. And then that might be cooler over here. And so it moves back. So it moves in a sweet spot. So that is the beauty of having a bar with a temperature gradient. That is the importance of having a bar with a temperature gradient if you are wanting to operate in this temperature domain. Now, um, he had Makor in there as well. I've talked about this before in other presentations. Chalani, uh, in Chalani's wire situation, he had mica, he specifically said lipid, uh, lipidolite, which has uh, lithium, which is a secondary interaction material, as identified by Piantelli for aneutronic reactions for the protons that get ejected from the exotic vacuum objects. Um, but uh, which we know from Piantelli's work that I presented in the early part of this can exist on the metal for up to three weeks. And I've been told that they can be there for two months. And according to uh, um, uh, Zatalepin and Baranoff, they can be in the material uh, for two years. And Lyon found them uh, still active nine months after with just reheating them. So... Um, you have the situation where he had this mica, which had these two beta isotopes in there, and lithium, which we didn't have because we were using muscovite. But muscovite still did have potassium in it. So uh, mica, all mica contains potassium. Okay, it also all mica contains uh, uh, fluorine, um, but only one type of uh, muscovite contains uh, fluorine in the potassium fluoride sense. And then you have Makor, and Makor is something like pot uh, potassium oxide. I think it's about 10% or certainly 8%. And you can go and look at this up, and I've given a, a link to it there. So you have potassium in both of these reactors in large quantities. And note, I'm saying here, other methods could be used to feed electrons to the EVOs, however. And, and those things were discussed uh, uh, in the work of uh, Shoulders. Beyond this resonant window, you need to go above 1000 degrees C, and I'm suggesting from the data that we've seen it's potentially above 1080 degrees C, uh, with dense matter to technologically produce low energy neutrinos, uh, aka cold neutrinos, via brute force kinetics between the solid matter, to have a more reliable production of them. Combining this with a range of beta isotopes is advantageous. So, yeah. In the case of Chalani Y, where it's supported on the mica, you had these thermal gradients, which we identified in 2012, uh, and that was Skip. He actually took uh, the HUG uh, IR camera to uh, the reactor, and you could see more than 100 degree temperature variation uh, between the different uh, parts where it was connected to the mica and, and in free space, as it were. Um, and in Piantelli, he had the temperature gradient. So they, in those two scenarios, they could continually produce excess heat because if something went in out of the, the uh, resonant area, it ceased to produce the cold uh, neutrinos or whatever. And, and, uh, and so it then became cooler and, and then it could come back into play, as it were. So it's like a cycling in and out. The, the, the system is dynamic. Um, this was completely missed in the work by uh, uh, Skinner, the Sydney Kimmel Institute, uh, New, uh, Institute for Nuclear Re Renaissance. They didn't have the mica and they didn't have the MACOR. <laughs> so they didn't have the potassium in there anywhere. Um, and so, and they didn't have in the case of what Chalani had, the, the lithium and, and the, the um, uh, rubidium. And also we identified that there's boron and lithium in borosilica glass where there isn't in the uh, um, uh, uh, fused quartz that we initially used and failed to produce excess heat with. So uh, this is it, uh, I think, uh, on 24th of June 2020. I hope you appreciate this presentation and all of the work that I've done over the last couple of weeks uh, to get this material out to you. Uh, we're starting really to get into the meat of what I call O-Day. Um, essentially, we've shown over the years that there are these uh, torus structures that somehow are able to capture material, that they're able to trans transmit through material, but they're also able to capture material, and they put it into a ring which is incredibly intensely compressing it, such that, in my view, I don't, I don't call it a black hole, I've been joking that I call it a black donut. It's kind of like it... It has a dimension because it's a ring, but inside there, the actual dimension of, of the material, when it's under this uh, 
electromagnetic compression, this kind of like superconducting intense magnetic pressure, it, it's, it's putting into what is almost a, a dimensionless ring uh, in, in terms of the nucleus cores. Um, and they have to arrange themselves in a way that is uh, more bosonic in nature. Otherwise, uh, they, they will get ejected. And are we seeing another uh, case of, we know protons get ejected, we know and have proven, uh, uh, Tom Clayton has proven that tritons get ejected. Um, is it the case that fluorine 18 is one of the, in, particularly in this scenario, as potassium fluoride with this tight bonding of electron and so on, with the interaction with string vortex solitons or their white form, uh, uh, white evos, is this uh, boson that is synthesized inside the structure? So if we go back to the chart, uh, we are starting with potassium 39 and uh, fluorine 19, let's say, and going to calcium and uh, fluorine 18, two fermions to two bosons. Let's say we have a trillion of these and a trillion of these. These oculi occupy two trillion spaces, and these, th this with exactly the same number of baryons occupy one trillion spaces. So if you're trying to uh, uh, compress it into a very small uh, box, as I call it, uh, which I'm now saying is a very small ring, uh, it's a black donut, not a black hole, um, uh, could it be the reason why this pre preferentially occurs? please consider subscribing and hitting that little bell. And if you feel that this work is valuable and you've learned something from it, it would really help if you could consider donating uh, something to help support this work. And you can see links in the uh, description of the video below. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.